Well, welcome to the Spring Bible Conference at Grace Community Church. We're so glad you're here. And uh, we will, Lord willing, we will be here throughout the weekend, uh, tonight, Saturday, morning and afternoon with an evening concert, and also uh, Sunday morning. So looking forward to a great time of fellowship. So glad you could join us. We are going to be talking about the essence of the cross. And we have divided it between three speakers, uh, myself, Jeff Seekins, Joel McGarvey. And we're going to do kind of a past, present, and future approach to the cross. Um, I had uh, actually this past year been uh, studying a lot uh, of the cross in the Old Testament. And so I asked to uh, take the past section. And then uh, I think uh, Pastor Jeff is going to take the present and uh, Joel McGarvey uh, the future with regard to the cross. So we're going to uh, look at the cross in the Old Testament. And I will have two uh, subjects under this heading. First, uh, this evening, we're going to look at the cross in Old Testament prophecy with regard to the actual predictions and facts concerning the cross. And then uh, tomorrow afternoon, we will be looking at the purpose and meaning of the cross according to the Old Testament, according to the, or we could say, the prophetic program. Uh, so we're, we're looking more at the, the facts of the cross now and the meaning of the cross, uh, Lord willing, tomorrow afternoon. The Bible is a book with many storylines. And of course, when I use the word story, I am not talking about a fable or fiction. We're talking about a true story. Um, one of the great hymns of the faith is, I love to tell the story. And... I remember years ago learning an important lesson. When I first started preaching, it was not long after uh, we had attended uh, this church for about six months, uh, received a call to pastor a church out in uh, Cope, Colorado. And <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was 22 years old when I took that church. And of course, when you're that old, just out of Bible Institute, you know everything, right? <laughs> and so uh, I felt like I need to I need to show these people that I know something, and so whenever I'd come to something basic like the cross, I'd kind of apologize and say, well, you know, this is pretty basic. I know you all understand this, and, and then I would go on and talk about it. And one dear old lady uh, came up to me and, and gently reprimanded me, and she said, don't apologize for preaching about the gospel and the cross. We love to hear that over and over again. And, and I have found that through the years, that that is absolutely true. Uh, people who know the Lord and truly are resting in his grace and in the finished work that he accomplished on Calvary can't get enough of hearing about the cross. And so, uh, fellas, our job is going to be really easy this weekend because uh, uh, everybody loves this subject, I, I trust. So the Bible is a story of a, a book with many storylines. It is the story of God, who he is. His essence, what he is made of, and who he is, what he has done, how he created the universe. Uh, the Bible lays out his plans for the ages, and it shows his ultimate victory in the end. If you ever are starting to feel down in this old world that we live in, uh, just read the book of Revelation through again, and you'll see, uh, yeah, we win. Uh, if, you're, if you're with the Lord, the Lord comes out on top. Uh, nothing to worry about there. But it's also the story of man. It's the story of how man broke fellowship with God, how man fell into sin. It's the story of how man continually rebelled against God, no matter what conditions God put him under throughout the ages. Man just continually rebelled. But it's also the story of God's plan to redeem mankind and to offer redemption through the blood of Christ. And of course, it is the story of Christ. It's the story of his eternal glory with the Godhead from eternity past and his absolute equality and essence and makeup and oneness with the Father and the Spirit. And it is a, the wonderful story of, of the willingness and obedience of the Son of God in leaving the glories of heaven and coming down to the earth to fulfill the will of God, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. 
But then there is a story that brings all of this and other stories of the Bible together, and that is the story of the cross. That brings the story of God and his great love. It brings the story of man and his wickedness and sin and rebellion and the wonderful story of the obedient Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. It brings them all together into one. And certainly we can say that the cross is the centerpiece of all eternity in God's dealings throughout history, throughout the future. It is the absolute centerpiece. So there really is, is uh, no greater subject that we could be grasping and, and studying from the scriptures this weekend. The cross is literally found from Genesis to Revelation and all parts in between. Sometimes it is found in seemingly cryptic statements that seem a little bit hidden and certainly would have seemed almost impossible to understand when they were first given. Aren't you glad we have a completed Bible? Amen. Don't we have the blessing of being able to look back? And you know, even at that, some of us have a hard time figuring some of this stuff out. But there's no, there's no excuse, is there? We can go back and we can understand those Old Testament types and figures. And that's how God often portrayed the cross in the Old Testament, as we're going to see. He used uh, people, he used events, he used uh, all kinds of different avenues to picture and portray what was coming. And then woven throughout some of the symbolism that is found in uh, the tabernacle, the sacrifices, and we're going to touch on, on all of those things, Lord willing. Woven in there is the wonderful story of the blood. And that is another amazing part of the cross, as we will see over and over again in the scriptures. And that's just the areas where God has, has sort of pictured things and maybe hidden it a little bit. Then there are those absolutely clear, explicit descriptions of the cross in the Old Testament. Hundreds of years before it happened, a thousand and more years before it happened. Very graphically portrayed for us. So we're going to look at all of that as well. Uh, in this message, as I mentioned, we're going to highlight the cross as revealed in Old Testament prophecy. First, the facts of the cross. And as I was studying this, I found that, uh, and by the way, I got a 10-point sermon, so hopefully uh, <laughs> hopefully we can get it all in. Uh, no, actually, I have a two-point sermon with uh, five subpoints each. <laughs> and uh, what I found is that there are some general references to the cross in the Old Testament, and then I found there are some very specific references to the cross as well. And so those are our two main points. We're going to look at the general references first, and we're going to look at five examples. And and uh, please, please don't come up to me afterwards and say, oh, you missed my favorite one, because I, I'm just not going to be able to cover everything. But I'm going to try and hit the really major pictures uh, and references to, excuse me, to the cross. And we're going to start in, of all books, Genesis. All right, so uh, turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, where we're we going to find, first of all, the first general reference to the cross uh, Theologians call the proto-evangel. How many of you ever heard of that, that term? The proto-evangel. Uh, why do theologians talk like that? Uh, proto is like prototype, right? What's a prototype? It's like the first example of something that's to follow. What's evangel? Who knows another, another way for to say, huh? Evangel. That means good news. So it's, the, it's kind of the pre-good news, the prototype of the good news. And that, of course, is found in Genesis 3, 15. So let's take a look at that. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Now, what do we find revealed here? I'm going to point out four things specifically that we find revealed in the proto-evangel, the pre-gospel. And you're familiar with this, I'm sure. Uh, the Lord is speaking here to the serpent who is uh, possessed by the devil, being used of Satan, to tempt Eve, of course, and because of that, uh, God is pronouncing the consequences of doing this. Uh, verse number 14 says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon the, thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And here it is, verse 15. 
And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now again, imagine getting that verse without any of the rest of the Bible and trying to figure out what in the world is that talking about. But you know, now we can look back and we can figure this one out through other scripture. First of all, and I'm just going to point out four things we see here. Number one, you see satanic opposition to the coming Messiah. And that's in the word enmity. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. So there's going to be uh, what we could call the conflict of the ages, very truly, between Satan, represented by the serpent, and the woman and ultimately the seed of the woman, who we now know to be the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing we see in the proto-evangel is the virgin birth of Christ, the seed of the woman. Now typically, uh, if you know a little bit about biology, we think of reproduction in terms of uh, an egg with the woman and the seed with the man, all right? So why would he say seed of the woman? Well, again, we now know that's a reference to the virgin birth of Christ. And why is that so important? That is so important because in order to provide a redeemer for a sinful, fallen human race, someone without sin had to be the sacrifice. And so in order to produce someone, it took a virgin birth. And the teaching of scripture is very clear on this, that sin is passed through the male. Now that doesn't mean that females aren't sinful because they're born uh, through the same process of a man and a woman coming together just like men. The women always look kind of smug when you say that. You know, <laughs> sin is passed through the male. But uh, that's just a fact. And uh, because that is the way that it works, if someone could be born without instrumentality of a human man, then you would have a sinless person. And that's the doctrine of the virgin birth of Christ. And he then was eligible to die for our sins because he had no sin of his own. The third thing we see in the proto-evangel is the ultimate destruction of Satan. Again, it says, it, referring to the seed of the woman, it shall bruise thy head. And a, a bruise to the head uh, represents a death blow. Now we know that uh, in the case of Satan, he will be eternally punished in the lake of fire. And that will be his demise. And he was judged at the cross. And Christ defeated him. And of course, that's the theme we're talking about, isn't it? And that's, that's a wonderful thing that took place there. But then we also see in this verse the suffering of Christ. It says at the end of the verse, thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, when it says thou shalt bruise his heel, he's speaking in relative terms. He's not saying that uh, Christ isn't going to die. But, but when you think about uh, a blow to the head or a blow to the heel, which would you rather have? You know, most, most people would rather have it in the heel, right? Uh, now, we know that Christ actually died for our sins. But compared to what's going to happen to Satan being bruised in the head, eternal death and punishment in hell, uh, Christ rose from the dead. And so it's described here as a bruise to the heel. All right, there's the first general reference to the cross. The second one that I want to look at is what some have called the scarlet thread of redemption that we find in Scripture. Uh, and sometimes uh, there's literally a scarlet thread used to describe this. And we won't turn to all of these for the sake of time. You can jot them down if you're taking notes. Are, we, are, you, are you putting those up? Yeah, you're putting those up. Great. Joshua 2, verses 18 and 19. And that's, of course, where the, the spies came in and uh, uh, stayed at the uh, uh, Rahab the harlot's house. And what were they to, what was she to put out of her window? And how did they escape out of the window? With a scarlet thread or a scarlet rope. Uh, and you'll find, and just look that up sometime in your Bible, look up scarlet, and see how many times God describes things as being scarlet, though your sins be as scarlet. And it's kind of interesting that God chooses blood 
the same color as sin. You know, sometimes we say, well, in the hymns that we sing, uh, you know, sin is black. No, sin is scarlet, according to scripture. But so is the blood of Christ. And that's how, uh, in God's way of doing things, both of them are the same color. And it is the blood that cancels out that sin. So you have that scarlet thread of redemption. Uh, one of the most famous verses of scripture, Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood is no remission. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. And uh, again, I'm going to just mention it in passing because we're going to go into much more detail tomorrow on some of these passages. But Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13, the Passover. When uh, Israel was about to leave Egypt and God instructed them to... Um, kill the lamb, and to put the blood on the doorpost and lintel. And when God came to that household that was under that blood, he would pass over that house. There again is a reference to the cross in a somewhat uh, mystical sense. But of course, later on, as we'll see tomorrow, very clearly identified as a type of the sacrifice of Christ. And then you have the thousands and thousands upon countless thousands, for, uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if I should say millions, but I wouldn't doubt it, throughout the Old Testament. Just imagine how many sacrifices were made. Uh, there were sacrifices for people who committed various sins. Well, how, how often did people commit sins? There were sacrifices that went on a certain calendar that were to be performed, um, and they were to, to, to take place over and over and over again. All of these pointed to that scarlet thread of redemption that culminated in the cross. So there's a second general reference to the cross. Uh, the third is the tabernacle. And again, we'll sort of mention it in passing and look in more detail tomorrow. Uh, the tabernacle in its very structure, pictures a cross, literally. If you look at the, the placement of the articles within the tabernacle, outside you had the brazen altar, brass speaking of judgment, where that animal was sacrificed. And then you had the laver in between the altar and the door to the tabernacle. And then you went in the tabernacle, and on the left side you had the golden candlestick Christ, the light of the world. And then on the right side, you have the table of showbread. Christ, the bread of life. And then straight ahead at the, the curtain or the veil, right before the Holy of Holies, right in front, you have the altar of incense. And that represented the prayers of the saints and ultimately the intercession of Christ himself. So, so far in, in the tabernacle, you have that straight line going through, and then you have the two to the sides, and then once inside the veil, you have the Ark of the Covenant, where the blood, once a year, the blood was taken in and presented and sprinkled on the seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And again, the, the very form of those items forms a cross, and certainly they picture different aspects of the cross. Okay, a fourth general reference to the cross uh, are the feasts of Israel. Let's just turn to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23 outlines the seven annual feast days of the people of Israel. And if you study these in detail, what you find is God is simply laying out the entire redemptive history of Israel through the seven feasts of Israel. And the first three portray the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for example, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 5 says, In the fourteenth day of the first month at even, or evening, is the Lord's Passover. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul identifies the Passover as a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ himself and his sacrifice 
that he may. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, halfway through the verse. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So uh, you couldn't get much clearer, could you, that that's exactly what God intended that to picture. And then the unleavened bread. Uh, the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were held uh, consecutive to each other. And back in Leviticus, uh, you go right to the next verse, verse 6, and it says, On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. So on the 14th, you have the Passover. The 15th, you start the unleavened bread. goes for seven days. And that pictures the burial of Christ. Now, why would I say that? Well, what was unleavened bread supposed to represent? Leaven in scripture represents sin. And so to have unleavened bread pictured the putting away of sin. And uh, during that period, the Jews would go through their entire house and they would remove all leaven from their home. They would sweep it clean and it, it became kind of a ritual that they would carry out every year eventually. And uh, they would be careful to make sure that every trace of leaven was gone. And you, again, you see the application that uh, Paul makes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 7, purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. Verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And unleavened bread portrays the purity of Christ ultimately in totally putting sin away. Um, he, when he went into the tomb, he rose without sin. He did away with it. And then the third feast is the Feast of first fruits. And back in our uh, Leviticus text, chapter 23 and verse 10, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, when ye, be, when ye be come into the land which I uh, give unto you, then shall and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And when you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 23, uh, the, the first fruits is identified. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. And that refers to the resurrection. So you have in the first three feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, and firstfruits, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ being portrayed. Um, and again, then we'll mention just in passing a fifth general reference to the cross, and that is the various sacrifices throughout the entire Old Testament. And there were just numerous kinds. We'll look at some of them tomorrow, but there were numerous kinds of sacrifices that portrayed different aspects of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Uh, sometimes they were to bring a, a, a bullock. Sometimes they were to bring a, a lamb. Sometimes a goat. There were, there were different purposes for each of these sacrifices. All right, now let's move on to some of the specific references to the cross. And let's turn to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. And this will be uh, the first of the next set of references. And that is the serpent on the pole. If you'll recall, when Israel was out in the wilderness, uh, they, they murmured and complained, and so God sent various... Uh, chastisements unto them, and one of them was fiery serpents. Numbers chapter 21 and verse number 5. And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. That was the manna. <laughs> verse number 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, 
and set it upon a pole. Let's just stop there a minute. Uh, where have you ever seen that image? At the, at the clinic, right? To this day, isn't that interesting? Here's, here's something of biblical origin that is openly displayed. And you know, these are good opportunities. If, uh, if, you, if you have an unsaved friend and, and you want to witness to them and maybe they're not feeling well, you can take them to the clinic or visit them in the hospital and say, hey, you know that image out there on the wall of the pole and the serpent? You know what that was? And there's just so many ways that you can uh, use to illustrate wonderful biblical teaching. And what were they to do? Verse number eight. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it, come to, it shall come to pass, that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass, that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. How many people, how many people do you think there were who tried to to treat this, this snake bite and bandage it up and put all kinds of medication on it. How many, how many people do you think tried that? You see, what was God teaching Israel? Oh, I'm getting into tomorrow's message. You know, this is really hard. This is really hard not to try and make the application, and, and I hope you don't miss it. But uh, this is an illustration of faith, if there ever was one, in the Old Testament. If God says, if you look at the serpent on the pole, you will live. What will a person who believes that do? He's going to look at the pole, right? <laughs> That's, and to me, that is just the, the absolute essence of what faith is, particularly under the prophetic program. Many times under the prophetic program, uh, God would give them something to do. And a lot of times they misunderstood that. They thought that doing the thing was what saved them, when in fact it was faith, all right? And you know, God didn't even have to say to them, and you have to believe that this is going to work. He didn't even have to say that to them to test whether they had faith or not, right? Because it would soon become evident whether they had faith or not by whether they bothered to go and find where that thing was set up. They probably had to travel a ways. I mean, there's, there's like up to six million people out in tents out here. They probably had to have somebody carry them or limp their way over. So yeah, they had to do something but it was an act of faith. God says, just look at the serpent on the pole and you'll live. It's that simple. And that's what faith did. We happen to be living in a dispensation where God hasn't given us any, any, anything to do. He just says, believe that my son died for your sins on the cross, was buried and rose again, that he paid the price. Just, just believe it. There's nothing to do. And you know, when we try to do something, we mess that whole thing up. Okay, but that's, I think that's Jeff's message. So we're going to just have to... <laughs> well, oh, well, this is tough. <laughs> All right. Let's look at a... Oh, and how do we know that this is a specific reference to the cross? Look at John chapter 3 and verse number 14. Now, my assignment was the cross in the Old Testament, so I can use everything up through, including the four Gospels, right? <laughs> Old, Old Testament. John chapter 3... And uh, verse number 14, and how do we know that's all Old Testament? Well, right up until the shedding of Christ's blood, what did Christ say? This is the blood of the new covenant, all right? So it's when Christ sheds his blood. So everything before that's Old Testament. John chapter 3 and verse number 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's, that's pretty clear, isn't it? That's, that's a direct divine interpretation of the Old Testament type. Nothing's left to the imagination here. It's Christ being lifted up. What a, what a wonderful fulfillment of that Old Testament type. Serpent on the pole. Second specific reference, Psalm 22 a detailed description of the crucifixion, Psalm 22. And this description is written about a thousand years before the crucifixion of Christ. And um, 
I'm not the greatest history student, but I'm told that the Romans were the ones who really invented crucifixion and that it really wasn't commonly practiced. Now, the Old Testament does talk about uh, cursed is the man that hangs on a tree. And uh, certainly uh, the Jews did practice hanging a body on the tree, but usually the body was already killed before they would put it up on the tree. Uh, but Paul does show that application in Galatians that, that that does apply to Christ as well. He hung on a tree. He bore the curse for us. So cursed is him that hangs on a tree. But crucifixion wasn't commonly practiced, which makes this psalm all the more amazing because it is a graphic, graphic description of death by crucifixion. And we'll just point out the main, the main points. Uh, you start right in at verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I mean, that is, that is certainly... Uh, one, if not the most familiar statements of Christ from the cross. Is it not? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here it is, a thousand years before, right in the Psalms. Certainly, God is tipping us off here, isn't it? This is a description of the cross. So you have the familiar cry. Secondly, you have the ridicule, verses 7 and 8. And I'm going to skip over some of this for the sake of time. All they that see me laugh me to scorn, verse 7. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, saying he delighted in him. You remember one of the thieves? Oh, Lord, uh, if, you can, if you can deliver us, or you can come down from the cross, come down and, and take us down too. And remember the other thief had to reprimand him. He says, hey, we're, we have a reason to be hanging up there. He doesn't. But sure enough, it was prophesied, wasn't it? Uh, third, the perspiration and thirst that would come from hanging there uh, out in the open sun, all day long, or as much as he did. Verse number 14, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. And, and of course, he thirsts. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Uh, thou hast brought me into the dust of death. And, and the Lord cried out, I thirst. The bones being pulled out of joint, that's, uh, I understand, common in the crucifixion. Uh, verse 14, uh, all my bones are out of joint. Uh, the fluid uh, gathering around the heart. Uh, verse 14, my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Uh, being surrounded by both Gentiles and Jews. This is interesting in verse number 16. For dogs have compassed me. What, what do dogs represent oftentimes in scripture? Gentiles. Gentiles. And that's what the Lord used in, in his own teaching, didn't he? When the uh, Syrophoenician woman came. Um, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. Dogs have compassed me. That would be the, the Roman soldiers. Those were those Gentiles. And, and certainly, you know there had to be uh, unbelievers that just sort of enjoyed going out and seeing who's being crucified that day. And so here are people just gathering around. But then it says in verse 16, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. The word assembly is the common word for congregation in the Old Testament. And I believe he's referring now to Israel. But he calls them the assembly of the what? The wicked. These were the unbelieving Israelites who said, crucify him, give us Barabbas. So yes, God predicted that those Gentiles and those Jews would be surrounding him. And of course, his hands and his feet being pierced. Uh, verse number 16, at the end, they pierced my hands and my feet. Uh, He's made a spectacle. Verse 17, I may tell all my bones. They look and they stare upon me. Uh, and then the casting of lots for his garment. Verse number 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Uh, well, you, you couldn't get much more detailed, could you, than that description of the cross. Certainly, it is vividly described here for us. All right, and then uh, the next very familiar text is Isaiah 53. Uh, and again, we're just going to uh, look over a few verses. We will go into them in more detail when we talk about the purpose of the cross according to the prophetic program. Isaiah 53. And actually, we want to start in verse 52 because he starts describing the, the extent of the suffering that Christ endured at the end of chapter 52. Verse number 14 says, As many were astonied at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. And the, the meaning, the literal meaning of, of that saying is, 
that he was so beaten that he didn't even look human anymore. Uh, and I personally uh, chose uh, not to go to, uh, what was the movie that portrayed so vividly? Passion. The Passion of the Christ. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing those that chose to. Um, but I just decided to keep the image that I have found from reading the scriptures in my head. But, as, and I, but I've been told how horrible they portrayed the death of Christ. Um, but I have to believe from this text that even that movie did not portray the extent to which Christ, he was, this says he was beaten to the point where he did not appear to be human anymore, okay? That is what it's talking about here. And then in chapter 53, you have those familiar words, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised, and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as the sheep before his shears is dumb, so openeth, he openeth not his mouth. And you'll recall how the Ethiopian eunuch just happened to be reading that text. Isn't that an amazing story in the book of Acts? as he was going home from observing the feasts up in Jerusalem, and Philip was directed by the Spirit of God to come and to ask him that question, which is just a great question. If you can get somebody to read anything from the Bible, ask them this question, do you understand what you read? Yeah. How can I, except someone should guide me? And guide him he did, right into this wonderful passage of the Lord Jesus Christ being portrayed once again, his crucifixion. All right, another uh, specific reference to the crucifixion, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. And here we find right, uh, right in the midst of the great uh, prophecy of the 70th week of Daniel. Verse number 26 says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And again, that's, uh, that's kind of a, a proto-evangel, but it tells us, now that we know what happened, he was cut off. How was he cut off? He was cut off in death on the cross. And yet it was, what does it say in verse 26? Not for himself. It wasn't because of anything he did, because he was sinless. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. And then one more specific reference to the crucifixion. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse number 10. And this, of course, looks forward to the second coming of Christ for Israel, not the rapture. The rapture is still a mystery in the Old Testament, still a secret, not revealed back there. But the second coming is revealed. Verse 10. Zechariah 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. The one who was pierced. An obvious, direct <coughs> reference to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says here that when they look upon him, <clears throat> they will mourn. Now, I believe there will be probably a couple of reasons they will mourn. If they remain in their unbelief, it is at that very moment that the sharp sword will go out of his mouth and will destroy all of his enemies. And so those who are unbelievers at the time of the second coming of Christ will be destroyed. But I believe this is a reference particularly to those who turn even at the last moment, and I believe there will be those who turn in faith 
at the last moment when they look upon him who they pierced and they will finally realize, particularly Israel, who's in view here, they will realize, yes, that one who our forefathers killed, crucified upon the cross, really was the Messiah. That will be the greatest moment of humbling and humility that will come upon the nation Israel. Because for over 2,000 years, in their unbelief, those who have not come to see the truth of the cross, the Jewish people have denied that that man was truly the Messiah. They're going to be humbled after over 2,000 years of pride of saying, no, that wasn't, the, that wasn't our Messiah. We didn't kill our Messiah. But they will see it when they look upon him who they have pierced. Well, I can hardly end, even though I'm in the Old Testament tonight, without asking you, have you placed your faith in the cross of Christ? Because that is God's requirement for today, that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in what he did when he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Have you trusted in Christ? Look to the cross in faith, believing that God accepted that sacrifice and that he was fully satisfied and you will be given eternal life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you that in Christ...